Tonight on Stockbox, for the next 90 minutes, we're giving you the opportunity to put your questions straight to the directors of three London-listed AIM companies, which hopefully will allow you to make an informed decision on your investment and better understand what the company is doing, how they spend money in pursuit of growth, and ultimately, how they plan to deliver returns for you, the shareholders. We have three directors joining us tonight. Robbie McRae, the CEO of Caracal Gold, Ben Turney, the CEO of Kavango Resources, and George Roach, the CEO of Premier African Minerals. The format will be to start with a 10 to 15 minute project specific interview, followed by an open Q&A session for 15 minutes. This is the moment where you can put your questions straight to the CEO speaking by using the YouTube live chat. The directors are bound by market rules, but they will do their best to answer your questions as best they can. Before we start, uh, we'd like to let you know that Stockbox will be at the UK Investor Show on the 21st of May in London. And you can get a free ticket to the show by using our code STOCKBOX22. Do pop by our stand if you're heading down, as it would be great to meet you all in person, since it's been such a long while since we've all been able to do that. So the code STOCKBOX22 on the UK Investor Show website will get you a free ticket to that show. To kick us off tonight, then, let's welcome our first guest, Robbie McRae, the CEO of Caracal Gold. Good evening, Robbie. How are you? Good evening, Mark. Very well, and you? Very good. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you very much for your time this evening. So we're going to be talking about the Kilimapesa gold mine, which is your 100% owned producing gold mine in Kenya. So to start us off with the first question, Kilimapesa is a producing gold mine with an initial target of 12,000 ounces production a year and a longer term target of 25,000 ounces per year. What is the roadmap to achieving these production targets? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, small correction, uh, not 25,000 ounces per year. We, we're targeting 24,000 ounces per year. <laughs> not, not a big issue. Um, we've, we've got three key building blocks, Mark, to, to take us from the current production through to that 24,000 ounces per year. The first one is people. Um, uh, we, we've had to recruit, a, a, we have recruited a very strong team of people. We've recruited people who've built big gold mines in West Africa, in South America, people who've operated um, big gold mines, explored for big gold mines. Um, I'll, I'll mention their names in the order that they joined us. Rian Lombard. Um, Rian is the new general manager, or well, it's not so new anymore, he's a general manager uh, out at Kilimapesa for us. Rian worked for Anglo Gold in West Africa. He ran the Sadiola mine. Um, he ran the Rosabel mine in South America. They did four and a half million ounces from <coughs> 2004 to 2016. Operations currently doing about 200,000 ounces a year. So Rian is a very experienced mine developer and mine operator. And he's brought a serious amount of skills to what we're trying to do at Kilimapesa. Um, Paul Reeves joined just after um, Rian joined. Paul is our, the CFO of Carrickel. Um, Paul also had, uh, I think, over 20 years experience in the gold mining industry in West Africa. Um, he was a key member of Thor Exploration, which developed, uh, I think it's the only commercial gold operation in Nigeria, 100,000 ounce per year, 100,000 ounce per annum operation, $200 million market cap. That's the kind of company we, 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 we're aiming to emulate and the kind of project we think we're going to develop at Kilimapesa. So Paul's brought all of those experiences with him. Um, and then the most recent member of the team, Frank, um, it's got a French surname. I'm going to try and pronounce it. Bazoon. <laughs> You'll probably tell me I've done it wrong tomorrow. But Frank, was, again, 25 years exploration and project development experience in the gold and uranium and rare earth industry in West Africa. He's worked for some, he's worked for Marley Lithium, he's, we, you name it. And um, when we were looking to employ Frank, I, I know the company that we were competing with. It's a major in West Africa who was offering him a tremendous package. Um, but he chose to join us because he's recognized the potential that there is in the East Africa region to emulate what's happened in, in, in West Africa. So the first thing for us to, was to, to build our team. Um, we've also strengthened our board. I, I don't want to talk too much about them. Maybe we'll get another chance to talk about them at another time. But Rachel Johnson and Dan Kazungu have joined our board. 
So we've strengthened our board and all of this on top of the team that we had already built. So we've got really good people and, and, and they know what we're doing and, 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 and they will get us there. The second thing is you have to have a project. If you don't have a project, what are the people going to work on it? Um, Kili Mapesa was, was, a, was a, bit, a bit of a jigsaw puzzle when we took it over. There was a, a mine and a processing plant, processing plant, but there was very little geology that had been done. Um, the mine had never been tested to its capacity. Was there open cost potential? Wasn't there open cost potential? Um, there was a tailings, a quasi tailing plant and a milling plant. And we've put plans together. We've ramped things up. We've tested things. And, and we now have, um, I remember we've only been listed for seven months. We now have a very solid development plan that pieces everything together from the exploration through the mining, the underground mining, the open cost mining, how are we going to configure the plants, how big we're going to make the plants. Um, the latest feather in our cap has been this very successful pilot plant that we've run on the heat leach. We, we're running heat leach um, pilot plant two at the moment, which is emulating the results from, from pilot plant one. So yeah, we, 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 we're very much on track. And with the guys that we've got on site now and the information that we're collating, um, I sometimes feel like I'm in a bit of a pressure vacuum. I, we've got all this work going on in the background, but you, you, you can't always announce it until it's done. So but I can see the, 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 the news flow building and, and, and all of this stuff will become very clear um, to the market soon. So it's the people, it's the project, and then it's doing the work. Um, we, 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 we're drilling like crazy. We, we bought two drill rigs. We've been drilling since the beginning of January. Um, Rian switched the guys from single shift drilling to double shift drilling. So we're drilling 24 hours a day, six and a half days a week now. So we really are, are getting through some meters. Um, mining side, we, 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 we're modeling, we're mining, we, 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 we're developing. We've got the open cost as, as well as the underground. Um, we've continued to invest in the plant. We've really focused on the heat bleach over the last three months. Um, and um, our the, the heat bleaches will still be a huge focus of attention for us, but a lot of our attention will now turn to the milling plant and to the tailings plant and what we're going to do on that plant between now and the end of the year. And that whole integrated plan takes us from where we are now to that target of 24,000 ounces a year. So we believe we've got everything in place to, 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 to achieve it. Excellent. Okay. Well, just thinking on the exploration upside then, within the Kilimapesa footprint, multiple targets on the prospecting permit have been identified for high grade and or shallow open pitable potential. Can you expand on these targets and what the potential exploration resource for Kilimapesa is? Yes, sure. Um, firstly, I, I know there's a couple of frustrated shareholders out there with us. We've been drilling for three months and we haven't published any results. Um, Frank and Rion came in and joined us. Um, one of the very first things that they did is they came in and, and, and did a very detailed audit on our internal procedures and our systems and applied best practices for the industry. That slowed down us getting the samples out from the site to the lab. Um, we made a call to respect their decision and rather slow it down and get it right from the beginning and have their buy-in from the beginning. Um, a massive batch of samples was dispatched about a week ago, and we're expecting the results for those to start feeding through in the next 10 days. So shareholders, we're going to start announcing those results soon. Um, and there will be great steady news flow coming from the drilling. We're drilling, we've got a good system, samples will be going out, results will be coming back in, and um, a, a little bit of other good news, which um, Rian and Frank confirmed, I could tell you guys today, is that we, we will have an, update, an updated resource statement before the end of the second quarter. We've programmed it all in and we will be putting out an updated resource before the end of the second quarter. So that's some exciting news and, and, and some a, a real achievement for us. For We've only been drilling for a quarter and, you know, we, 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 we're really in a position we're going to be announcing that. Um, within the Kili Mapesa license area, um, we, 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 we've got 10 targets. The Kili Mapesa Hill, is that that's where we're mining that's where we have our underground mine that's where we have our open cast operation and that's where all the drilling has been focused until now um all the rc drilling and all the diamond drilling has been um, focused on there now um when i was on site this last weekend I was with the team and we were talking about how much longer do we still have to drill on the hill until um we can take those rigs and move them up to some of the other regional targets and 
um, on Sunday when I go back to site, they should be able to give me that answer. And, and I believe they'll also then present the regional exploration program to me. But um, we've, we've categorized the 10 targets into um, priorities. We've got four priority one drill targets. Obviously, the Kelly Mapesa Hill, where, we, where we're mining. We've got the Red Ray target, where we've already got 22 holes that were drilled. We've got 140,000 ounces going in 2.8 grams a ton. Um, a lot of the, the regional exploration work and trenching and sampling that we've done on the site saying we could get up to five gram a ton stuff there. Um, it's, a, it, it's an easy target for us to get to. It's right near our camp. So Red Ray is one of them. Teng Teng. Teng Teng, um, historical mine. The, the colonials mined it historically. Up to 12 gram a ton material coming out of it. It's never been drilled, but it's right along the main road, very close to our plant. So that's another category one for us. Magor, which is the largest target within our license area. Um, the, also, the historical work going 12 grams a ton, and it's the largest target. I can't wait for Frank to get the rigs onto that. Um, and then we've got Redway West, Vim Ruther, Nuttingili, Oli Poi Poi, Solman, and Alpha Ray. So just within our current exploration area, we've got 10 drill-ready targets where we can move those rigs. Um, and a lot of them have got higher grade indications from the, the current hill where we are at the moment. So I'm very excited for those rigs to finish on the hill and get onto this regional stuff and, and, and see what we can find. And we know the gold's there. The colonial guys were mining it. Um, KPG drilled it to a limited degree and got some good results. Now we'll drill it properly and, 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 and very exciting times. Um, we've got high confidence in a lot of them like Red Ray because 22 holes have already gone in. Um, so, yeah, that's, we, we're very excited about the exploration potential off the hill in the rest of the license. And hopefully we'll be starting that soon. Um, okay. The, we, from now until the end of the year, we're planning 20,000 meters, an additional 20,000 meters of RC and another 3,000 meters of diamond. Um, that, 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 that's a lot of drilling. You know, that, that, that's, that, that, that's a lot of drilling. So that's going to be a good news flow and a lot of results. Yes, it certainly sounds like a lot of news flow and also some rapid progress considering you say you've been listed for, for not, not so long, really. On, on yeah. the drilling campaigns, uh, Robbie, what, what, what are the objectives? Is, is it as simple as to find more gold, build a resource and expand on what you've already got? Um, a promoter like me, find more gold and, and, and get more ounces. Um, technical people like Frank and Rian, they're very excited about finding the additional ounces but they also want to improve the quality of the answers. So um, Frank and Rihanna are as excited to move something from inferred to indicated to measured as they are in finding another 100,000 ounces and taking us you know, up, up, up that curve. So the program that they've put together is a good marriage of both. Um, you know, we've, we've got to keep ourselves marketable. Um, we, we're at 670,000 ounces now. Ask anyone, what's the next number? It's a million. So we want to get there. But uh, while we're doing that, we want to be converting 25, 30% of those inferred into indicated each time. So it's not only growing, it's also improving the quality at all times. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. You're bang on time there at 14 minutes past. So it is time yeah, to, <laughs> it's, it's excellent timing. Well done. I know it's the first time we're, we're live together. So, uh, so well done there. Um, we're going to now go to the floor for questions to shareholders. The first one that I have that's already come in is that can you give an update on the recently acquired Lake Victoria Gold projects? Sure. Um, we, we, we announced the acquisition in November. Um, obviously, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phase thing. You've got a technical due diligence component. You've got a legal due diligence component. Excuse me. You, you have a, um, a financial due diligence component. You, you, have, um, you have to deal with the government, um, competition, commission, all these sort of things. Um, we, we, we're on track to close that out by the end of May. Um, so, so, so that's very exciting and be a good acquisition, some, uh, some good additional allowances. Um, Frank is running his, his ruler over it and, he, and he's promised to give me his final report on it by Sunday. But yeah, we're on track to close Tanzania out by, by the end of May and then We'll come to the market, announce the closure, and present the work program on, and what we're going to be doing. And we'll then be a, a multi-project, um, multi-jurisdiction company. Okay, excellent. 
Okay, another question I have is: Is the company <laughs> looking to add? Is the company looking to add further ounces via further acquisitions? Um, Mark, we've been brought some incredible projects. Um, uh, Jason Stroke of Genius of, of of having us based here in Nairobi has. Um, we, we we've been brought projects from all over East Africa, um, and 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 we've got some really really exciting projects that 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 we're looking. Some is previously producing gold mines with still got multi-million ounce resources in them. Um, some, some, some exciting frontier jurisdictions where some of the big boys have said they want to go, but they won't go like South Sudan. Um, but the board and, 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 and my decision, well, not my decision, the board's decision is we've got to, we, we, we've got to demonstrate the value in, in Kilima Pesa. We've, we've got to close out Tanzania and we really need to get this market cap up 50, 60, 70, 100 million pounds before we can make another serious acquisition. But um, I've, I've, I've got a serious list of projects on my desk and, and, and some of them are very attractive. And we've got the political connections now, not the political, political connections. We've got Dan Kazungu on our board, um, who's very wide into East Africa, very, very well respected. He's the previous Minister of Mines of Kenya. He's a great asset in helping us and, and, and has brought one of these opportunities to the table. Um, so if we can get the market cap up um, and, 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 and we can do a share deal or with the market cap up and we've got enough cash in the bank, we could do a serious acquisition um, okay. once we've got, got Kilima Pesa and Tanzania better down. Okay. Well, just talking on getting the market cap up, I think, was it today it was announced you, you've purchased £42,000 worth of shares? So show of confidence there, is it, Robbie, from the CEO? Yes, uh, I am. Um, we've, we've, we've. There's, there's been a seller. Somebody's been constantly selling us down, and okay. um, I, I follow some of the, the, the groups. And there's been a concerted, concerted effort from some of our loyal shareholders to try and get rid of the seller. So I thought I'd try and do my, my part, and, and, and I bought a few shares. And there's some nice commentary in the market about buying it. Um, some comments saying. Have I, is this going to delay all the announcements that we've been planning? But no, it won't do. It was, um, yeah. I'm, I'll show, show that I'm in with the shareholders and, and got some real money and some some real um, skin in the game. Excellent. Okay. Well, I did see some questions popping up. So um, let's see if we have any questions from the floor. Here we go. So, how do you plan to fund the development and expansion program? Most of what we've done to date has been funded by, by working capital. I mean, the, 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 all, all, all the drilling we've been funding out of working capital and um, funds that we're generating from the mine. So far on the heap lead, it's all been done. Um, the, the, the big expansion, we are going to have to go come to the market to raise money to fund it. We, we, we're, not, we're not making enough money to, to fund developing of a, of a completely new mine. Um, the first thing we need to know is how much money do we need? And, and we're very close to finalizing those numbers. I had those numbers on my screen while I was waiting for this conference to come up. And I've been working with them, working with the team with them for over the last two weeks. Rian's given me a commitment that by middle of next week, we will really have those numbers refined. And, and what they're doing now is, is, is overlaying the project program over those numbers. So yes, um, we, 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 when, we, when, when we announce the expansion program, we'll announce how we're going to be funding the expansion program. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, next question. Um, what are the production costs per ounce? Do you know? Um, we, as you know, we've got three plants um, and we've, 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 we, we've, we're, we're, uh, we're running at an all in sustaining, an all in sustaining cost of between a thousand and a thousand two hundred dollars an ounce, but that's been on the milling plant and and the and and the tailings plant. We don't have the numbers um, in a presentable format that we can present to the market yet on the on the heap leach. They're significantly lower than um, than than both the milling plant and the tailings plant. So I hope everyone will appreciate we we're still in the pilot plant. We're basically in the feasibility study stage, so we're refining those numbers. We, we've got the numbers from pilot plant one. We've we've loaded the pad for pilot plant two, and again, um, Rian and his team of site. By the time pilot plant two is done, they'll then present the big heap leach project, which um, I mean, to to throw out numbers, we're talking about a 1.2 million ton per annum pad. 
and 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 we'll 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 publish the expected operating cost numbers when we put that out. But we're working okay. hard to get those numbers together. Okay. Okay. So we can wait to see them coming up. Thank you very much. Is there any news on the reefs license at Tanzania? Um, that that that's part of the package. The the reefs license belongs to the company called Tyx, and that's the that's the transaction that we're close to closing. We will we'll close out by the end of May. Okay. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Do we have any other questions from the from the floor? Any further questions for Robbie McRae, the CEO of Caracol Gold? No? Okay. Well, I'll ask you a question then, Robbie. Yeah. What can we look you, you've you've mentioned there's lots of news flow to come. What what certain milestones are you looking forward to that you you're keeping an eye out for that uh, that shareholders could also uh, keep an eye out for in the in the next six months? Um yeah, uh, constant updates. Um, on the results from the drilling, from the exploration, the first one out in the next 10 to 10 to 12 days. Um, the resource update is, 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 is obviously a big one, and, and that's that we're committing before the end of the second quarter. Um, the, the quarterly report, which will be coming out up shortly, we, we're putting the finishing touches to that. Um, and then obviously the, the, the overall development program on, on exactly what we're going to do between now and the end of the year to deliver into what we've committed. So yeah, th 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 those are the milestones. Um, one of the things I'm very excited about is, is getting that, that, that first resource or the, the first resource, the bigger resource out of the hill and then really getting those drill works out to go and test some of the exploration targets. So it's, it's going to be an exciting time for our company. Okay. Okay. Well, Thank you very much, Robbie McRae. Unless there are any further questions for Robbie, the CEO of Caracol Gold, then, uh, oh, hang on, do we have, are you looking at any other commodities? Um, Caracol Gold is, we're, we're a dedicated gold company. Um, we have had a number of very exciting um, other commodity projects come across our desk. Um, if, if the right project came across our desk, um, we, 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 we might look at, at we might look at copper. We think copper and gold might go together. Um, I, do, we, I don't think we would look at energy metals or anything like that. I don't think the market would understand the gold mixed with energy metals company. But certainly, uh, my, my, my board might, might consider us having a look at a, at a copper project and copper gold. I mean, Barrick has been very successful. Okay, they're, they're massive and they've got copper gold, but you know, that, that seems to fit together, but at the moment we focus on gold. Okay, okay. I have a question that's coming just on the email. Um, do you have any issue with illegal miners in the area? Um, I, I don't. I don't want to call them illegal miners. They're artisanal miners, um, and there is a legal framework in Kenya for artisanal mining. So, um, as a legal landholder, if you own a piece of land. You, 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 you're allowed to mine within the first couple of meters of that land legally. Um, okay. So we do have artisanal miners within our exploration permit. We don't have any problems with them. We work with them. We work alongside them. We, we, we have a, a very close relationship with, with, with the government. The government encourages us to help the guys, the artisanal miners, keep them safe, um, etc. And Rachel, um, having joined our board, is going to head up a, a program where um, it's going to be a, a, tri -part, a tri party thing where, where it's ourselves, it's the artisanal miners and the government. And Kilima Pesa is going to be the trial run for this thing, headed up by Rachel from our side, um, to try and formalize the relationship. Um, the, the, government, the government wants it to be safe. Um, the government wants it to be environmentally friendly. And unfortunately, some of our friends, the artisanals, are still using mercury and discharging cyanide into streams, et cetera. So we've got to get away from that. Um, they're not paying uh, the gold on a lot of the gold that they produce. They're not paying royalties. So we work with them. We don't have a problem with them. They are there. I, I consider them a, the most superb exploration tool. Those boys get up in the morning and they mine 20 grams a ton. <laughs> so he's mining 20 grams a ton and I can put a drill hole close to him and, and define something. It, it, it's a good <laughs> Okay, thank you. I see another question has popped up. Uh, has there been a delay to the NSX listing? 
there was a delay. We, we were trying to get the NSC, NSX NSC listing done um, in, in October, November of last year. Um, we fell foul of a, an, an issue on, on accounting. Um, our, we, our audits and accounts became stale. I heard the accountant use that word today, and, and we had to push it out. Um, we've brought in a lady called Sheila Boyd. Um, Sheila's a very experienced Kenyan um, administrator and, and businesswoman. She's heading that up for us, and I believe by the end of the second quarter, so very soon, same time we're going to be publishing our updated resource results. Sheila will have that done. Um, I've been working very closely with her. All the CFOs have been working very closely with her and getting all that documentation done. Um, and the, the emails that I've seen were in the final strokes of that. Okay. I see another question has popped up. Would it be worthwhile purchasing additional drill rigs in view of the amount of drilling both in Kenya and Tanzania? Uh, that my favorite question of the night. I, I was <laughs> hitting the table on Sunday with Rian and, and Frank telling them, we need more rigs. We, we need more rigs. So I was saying, Robbie, we need more money. We need more money. We need to make more money. So, yes, we, 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 we're talking about it. Um, uh, uh, I think if everyone can just appreciate Frank, Frank's been on site for four days, yeah, um, and 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 he's he's got a, a lot to to bite off and chew. Um, the 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 two drill rigs, I'll I'll, I'll make the statement and Rian might tackle me on it later. But the two real rigs that we've got on site at the moment will be drilling at Kilima Pesa for at least the next two years. Those, those rigs won't move. So if anything, we'll bring in additional rigs to complement the two rigs that we've got there. And Tanzania will be a, a, a separate a, a separate set of rigs. Tanzania is easier. It, there's a lot of drilling contractors in Tanzania, so um, quite easy to mobilise a contract to get them on site fast. We may not have to buy our own rigs in in Tanzania, but if it was my decision, I would I would be putting some additional rigs on the ground in Kenya soon. Um, and as soon as Kenya and as soon as Tanzania is closed, we'll we'll start drilling it. That's the first step. That's what we've got to do. Okay. So yes, Excellent. there will be additional rigs in both countries. Additional rigs. Okay, good, good. I have another question that's just come in on the email. Uh, are GCAT looking to use the warrants model to raise equity rather than straight equity raises? Um, yes, of course. We, we've got quite a few warrants out there. Um, I, I, I was looking at the warrant schedule a couple of days ago for, 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 for the audits and accounts. Um, but, but for the warrants, we need the price to go. So we need to get rid of the seller, and and we need the price to go up. Um, and quite a few, quite, we've got quite a few warrants out at one point two five, but we've got a lot of warrants out at, at, at two and a half p. And if we can pull in that money at two and a half p, yes, it's but we've got to get there. We've got to get the news flow, and um, we've, we've got to get rid of the seller and 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 get to that price so people can exercise. Okay, excellent. Well, unless there are any more questions coming in from the live chat on YouTube, um, which the, I'll give just another minute or so for people to perhaps ask some questions. But thank you very much, Robbie, uh, for your well, time you, tonight. We are on time. We're doing well on the time, which is good. Uh, it's nice to see you uh, well prepared and uh, it's gone smoothly. Thank you very much for... Uh, it's a wonderful format. It's, it's been very good. And I hope I hope the people who are watching have enjoyed it. It's, it's been good. Us. Yes, I'm, I hope shareholders have got something something from that. So I think uh, I think we're uh, we're okay. So um, if you can stick around, Robbie, at the end we will probably yeah. bring you back in, and we'll have a bit of a roundtable discussion with all our other guests. But yeah. for now, Robbie McRae, the CEO of Caracol Gold, thank you very much for your time. We'll take a quick two minute break, and we'll be back with uh, Ben Turney from Kavango Resources. Good luck, Ben. Hope it goes well.
Welcome back to Stockbox Premiere. Our next guest from Kavango Resources, Ben Turney, the CEO, and also Jeremy Brett is joining us. So we've got two from Kavango Resources. Good evening to you both. Ben, how are you? Very good, thanks, uh, Mark. It looks like, Jeremy, you're on mute. I think, uh, yeah, there we go. Also, right. yes. Very Hi good. there, Jeremy. Good evening, Jeremy. How are you? Oh, very good, thanks. Very good. Good. Well, thank you very much both for your time. We're going to be talking today about the Kalahari Suture Zone. So the first question I want to put to you, uh, you can decide who, which one of you wants to answer it. What exactly is the Kalahari Suture Zone in Botswana? And why are Kavango so excited about the size of their land portfolio in the area and the elephant scale opportunities that this portfolio presents for shareholders? Well, I think, Jeremy, the market's heard enough from me. So why don't we hear from someone <laughs> who knows what they're talking about on the KSZ? Yes, ha happy to uh, provide input on that. Yes, the... the uh... Kalahari Suture Zone, it's at the Craton margin, at the, the edge of the Kapval Craton in southern Africa. And so this is a major continental structure. It's at the edge of very um, deep crustal rocks. And, and this is a, an area where you can have uh, a lot of uh, geological activity. It's, it's a zone that's about 300 kilometers long. There's lots of room and uh, Kavango has staked an awful lot of that uh, strike length. And it's characterized by a, a linear chain of uh, very strong magnetic anomalies right along the suture zone. And uh, these are interpreted to, to represent possible intrusions. So you can have all sorts of uh, magmatic intrusions along the zone. It's a great location. Uh, we think we have those intrusions. And, and we, we've interpreted these to have a tremendous uh, nickel copper or PGE potential. And, and so, so this is really the focus. And uh, I think it, it's, it's worth mentioning that you, you've got uh, two styles of intrusion, which which are, are being targeted by Kavango, one are the uh, Karoo intrusives, which are more shallow. They're up in the overlying sediments above the basement rocks, and then you've actually got some potential that we're working on in the Proterozoic basement. So these are deeper deeper rocks. Except down the south end of the of the suture zone, you've actually got some of these Proterozoic rocks which are coming closer to surface, so uh, they might be more reachable. Okay. Now, Kavango completed a proof of concept drill campaign in February. When can we expect to hear more results from this? And what is the latest concerning the B1 conductor? Well, Jeremy, um, I'll talk a bit more about sort of what to expect. Mm. But I think probably, again, it'd be good to hear from you on, on the B1 conductor and sort of what, what we discovered mm. with the drill and what the next steps are. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Well, we're in the midst of expanding the uh, surface and and borehole time domain EM, uh, time domain electromagnetic surveys in the area. The reason for this is that the, the first drill hole uh, has not come back with the results we wanted. Uh, but that being said, uh, uh, when we did the downhole electromagnetics, we, we've still detected the uh, strong um, conductor. So we think this is still in play, to be honest. And, uh, and it's, it's not unusual with uh, nickel exploration and with uh, time domain electromagnetic um, surveys and this, this sort of program to actually have to take a step back, redo the surveys, recalibrate, and then take another another run at it. And so the, the really the good news, the upside here, is that we not only have picked up the conductor again, it's actually even a little bit stronger than before. And we think we've actually found a second conductor now. And so this, this is a slightly more geologically complex scenario than we initially thought, so that's why it's going to take another couple of drill holes. With it. And at the moment, obviously, Jeremy, we're, we're doing uh, more TDEM, which we've announced to the market, and obviously results for that will be coming very soon. Could you exactly. just tell everyone a bit about the sort of the, the loop designs that, that you uh, created with Caslotta? Yes, uh, that, that's changed too this round. Uh, initially, we just used one time domain loop, and so uh, this was good as a, a sort of an initial reconnaissance survey, but now, now we're using two loops, and, and the purpose is to sort of exhaust all possibilities for the geometries of these conductors. Uh, so we're really going at it hard with the, uh, the time domain electromagnetics to, to really pin down where these are with the electromagnetic modeling. Uh, that'll go off to one of our specialists in Australia, and, uh, and then we, we should be able to target to these, these uh, conductors very nicely. Exactly. So, Mark, I think to answer or to start to answer your question about what will come next, we know that the next time we put the drill bit into the ground to, to go for these targets, we have to hit them. There's no two ways about it. We know this as a company. The, the share price has obviously dropped quite a lot because the market views the last drill as a miss. 
But as Jeremy said, it's actually turning out not to be a miss. And the next set of TDEM, we're very excited about the next set of results. We've got some preliminary stuff we've already seen, which has confirmed what we've already put out in the public domain. But we'll be putting a more substantial update out about that in the very near future. And the plan is certainly then to, to come back and drill these two targets. But what we're also going to do is we're going to do a much more extensive TDEM campaign over the um, northern section of the KSZ and also do some T, uh, TDEM down in the south. But we're also going to hit the great red spot. Uh, we're going to hit the great red spot with 50, at least 15 more TDEM surveys. We're going to cover all of the great red spot, as Jeremy said, with new loop configurations. Now that we've learned more about the underlying geology, we've got a lot of confidence in this as a very high priority target area for us. And the primary target, of course, which at the moment is exhibiting a 16,000 Siemens conductance reading. I mean, this is this is a really very, very significant target that we are going to come back and drill. In terms of the nearer term, uh, there's a hell of a lot going on. We've got a major re internal report that we're writing at the moment on the proof of concept campaign. So we have uh, assay results, petrology, we've got sort of various analysis, more surveying work that we've done as well. So we've done AMT work over um, the KSZ. So we're going to be publishing quite a comprehensive strategy document for both what we've learned, what we've discovered over the last six months, and how that's changing our changing our exploration moving forward. Uh, Jeremy mentioned about our magnetic model earlier and these magnetic bodies, those are extremely important for us. We had the original underground 3D model that we created in 2020. Well, we've now got version 2.0 of that that's nearing completion, which is much more accurate. We've got a much higher degree of confidence in it because we've drilled this now. So we've actually got core data to back up the, the geophysical interpretation. And what's particularly encouraging is that in two of our holes, and again, this is already in the public domain, in two of our deep holes, the 2,000 metre holes that we drilled, which were in two completely distinct uh, geological settings in target area A and target area B, which is the great red spot, the, um, the drill bit hit the Proterozoic pretty much exactly where it was modelled. So, so moving forward, we're much leaner and much sort of um, greater fighting shape. And we've also got this uh, new mineralisation model that we've talked about. Now, we've been a bit vague about this so far. The reason for that will become clear. I think a lot of companies sort of knowing what we know now, they would have come and you know immediately promoted the hell out of this idea. But Cavango being what Cavango is today, we're taking a much more thorough, rigorous approach, really crash testing our ideas before we put them out into the public domain. But we'll have an update on that very soon. And Jeremy has done some really fantastic work that we can't can't wait to share with everybody. Okay, excellent. Well, what other exploration work has the Kavango technical team done to date? And what are the high priority targets in this vast land portfolio that you've got? So, Jeremy, do you want to tell us a bit about sort of the, the surveying? Yes, so we've had um, ongoing all year, pretty much we've had ongoing uh, gravity surveys. Uh, we, we've had the, uh, the TDEM surveys that we've just mentioned. And uh, those TDEM surveys are, are planned to be greatly expanded. And, and uh, the objective with the TDEM surveys is, is to, to really push to build up an inventory of conductive targets for Kavango so that we can uh, you know, distribute the risk and, and prioritize targets. Uh, we've also uh, been uh, perfecting the audio magnetotelluric technique on the property. And uh, we, we've got a great system running and, and um, uh, we, we've got some really good inversions coming out uh, for these. So, I think this is probably the first time in Western Botswana that anyone actually has a really good uh, view geophysically of, of, say, the crew sediments, the structure, and uh, and also deeper into the Proterozoic. So, so uh, technically, it's really advancing very nicely. Yeah, okay. and we're obviously Excellent. we're working very closely with Kaz Lotter and Spectral Geophysics um, as our key partner out there, and the work that Hillary's doing as well. Hillary has his own company called 3D, who does which does work for for Kavango. Mm -hmm. So we've we've got some really fantastic equipment and teams out there, and, and like Jeremy says, we really are pushing the frontiers on this. Okay. Well, Ben, you did mention about news flow to come, but I wonder if I can ask you, what is the roadmap looking like for 2022 and beyond? And are we likely to see more drilling once the petrology reports have been received for the recent holes? Yeah, so the, the more drilling won't follow immediately after the petrology reports. There, there is more TDEM work, as we said. So the next phase of exploration in the KSZ is target acquisition. We're going to be talking much more about this over the coming months. 
We're also going to be talking much more about making the project partner ready. Uh, we think we've now got enough to start showing potential joint venture partners to start to bring other people in. We've all known about the blue sky upside of this project. The KSZ is a huge project and Cavango's done very well to take it as far as it, as it has so far. And we can certainly take it forward in terms of the next steps. But obviously, there's still a hell of a lot of ground to cover. So um, we are going to start to look now very seriously at what we can do to sort of expand the project really at pace. In terms of drilling, we've got the drill rig in the field. So we've got a great relationship with Mindea, which is co-owned by Equity Drilling. I mean, these guys have, have moved mountains for us, uh, subsurface mountains. They, um, they the, the drill campaign in the in the KSZ was a, was a technical success. We went through some very, very challenging drill conditions on the last hole in particular. We came very close to losing the hole at one stage, but they managed to save it. So all of those holes were a massive technical success. We drilled 3,300 meters. We're the first company ever to have done that. All other historic exploration in the KSZ has, has usually been beset by, by technical failure and ultimately holes have been stopped before they've actually reached their target depths down the sort of depths we've gone to. So we want to keep that rig in the field. So at the moment, the rig is at Ditto. Uh, we're drilling a sit minimum six hole um, drill campaign down there. We're working through the gears. It's all going to plan so far. Drilling conditions are much easier, um, albeit the environment's a bit harder. So water access is a bit tougher and it's a bit more remote than the KSZ itself. But the plan then is that once we've finished at Ditel, which will probably be in about 10 to 12 weeks time, based on the current um, expectations for holes we're going to drill, we're then going to take that rig, mobilise it to one of our other projects. So whether we take it straight up to the KSZ North, we don't know yet. Much will be determined by the TDEM campaigns. But as Jeremy also mentioned, and there's, I think, a bit of a hint here for sort of where our thinking is in the future, we're really interested in what we're looking at in the KSZ South. Um, we want to go and learn more about the geology because there's been very, very little drilling down there. And according to our models, which in the north we have a great deal of confidence with, we really would like to go and drill test those in the south to see that if we can get a similar sort of correlation to what we've modelled is down there. And if it turns out the Proterozoic is much closer to surface, which we believe it is, then that could really become a huge exploration target for us. Meanwhile, up in the KCB, we're going through final stages now over the next couple of months of uh, target delineation. So we've already identified target areas that are very interesting to us, but we're now looking much more specifically at sort of honing in on high priority target areas. The big difference between Ditto and the KSZ and the KCB is where Ditto and the KSZ are, are much more sort of greenfield projects. You know, these are these are projects that we really are sort of, you know, breaking new frontiers with. Up in the KCB, the exploration model is much more tried and tested. So when we do actually come to put the drill bit in the ground, there'll be a lot more, you know, a heavier expectation on our shoulders to deliver mineralization. So it won't be proof of concept. So that's why at this stage, we need to get as thoroughly prepared as we can before we start to put the drill bit in the ground. But we'll be looking to take on a second rig there, which is something I've talked about in the past. Um, so that's still very much the plan. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. So we are bang on time. Uh, we can open the floor to questions from the audience. Oh, there's one popping up already. Uh, we have three huge and very exciting projects. What is the situation in regard to getting a, getting the drill rigs? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll add a bit more to, to what I just said. So we've um, we've announced in the past that we're looking at developing a strategic relationship um, with with Mindea. Uh, working relationship so far has been going great. And one of the reasons we haven't closed in on that yet is we've just simply been too busy. There's been so much work within the company, both internally developing our programs and obviously Minea have been very active for us in the field. As everyone's aware as well, you know, the, the metal um, uh, space is, is going wild at the moment. So Mindea are not only working with us, they are working with others. I mean, they've maintained fantastic quality of service, but the relationship's working really well. So our expectation is to build on that relationship with them. It's pretty much suicidal for exploration companies to get involved with drilling directly themselves. There are some companies who try to do it and it's almost always a failure. It's a very technically challenging and demanding business. So it's important to work with the right people. And we do feel that we have that. So, so the plan is to, to build on this really excellent relationship we have. And then sort of once we're, once we're ready, once funds are available, then yeah, we'll look to open up more on these projects. Okay, excellent, thank you. So well, we have another question. Jerry um, the last interview, you were nine out of ten on the KSZB hole. What is your confident on the next? I, I'm still very confident, and the reason for that is the conductor hasn't disappeared. As a matter of fact, it, it's gotten a little bit stronger in terms of conductance, and we now have a second conductor. 
uh, we find the orientation of these to still be very interesting and very prospective. So I, I, I would say we're, we're still in play and nothing's changed for me. I'm, I'm still very bullish on this for sure. So Jeremy, I'm conscious of putting words into your mouth, but I think it might be worth just saying a bit about the, the downhole EM as well and just sort of the, the confidence that now gives us because we've got a completely different perspective on what we're looking at because previously, obviously, we were looking from surface or from mm -hmm. 300 metres above the target. So could you perhaps just share a bit with, with your thoughts on that? Well, that's a very good point, Ben. Um, you know, uh, previously, we simply had uh, surface data, so we have two-dimensional data and we're going after a three-dimensional target. And now, now we have expanded two-dimensional data at surface, plus we have got added a third dimension with the downhole EM. And we, we actually combine these together for the modeling. So, so uh, if anything, the confidence is going up in the position of these. And uh, I, I certainly think we, we have to be testing these conductors. We have to. <laughs> no, no question in my mind. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I've not seen any assay results from the previous KSZ drilling. Have I just missed that or have you not shared that info? I appreciate the drill was between the two targets, but are there results? Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah. about assay testing, I do think people, I mean, we get a few comments about assay testing and I think people have, have been a bit sort of too obsessed with these. Um, the campaign itself, it was a, a geological proof of concept campaign. We were very clear about that from the very beginning. So the assay tests are an important component, but the assay tests released on their own don't give the full picture of what it is that we've actually been doing in the region. So at the moment, what we're doing is we've got the petrology tests, we have the assay tests, we've got further surveying, further interpretation, we've recalibrated our models. And there's a hell of a lot of other work that, that's going into this. So what our plan is, we're going to present everything all in one go, rather than sort of present little pieces of the story and what could end up being sort of a misleading view. We wanted to do a comprehensive piece of work to, to release the results, show what we've learned. You know, we've made a few mistakes along the way as well. We, we can, we'll put our hands up to those, but those are very valuable lessons for us as well. But the, the sort of the, the meat of what we're going to present, you know, we are very, very excited about. And moving forward, where in the past, with the best will in the world, you know, a lot of what Cavango has done has been educated guesswork. Now we've got drill core. We've actually tested our models. This mag the version 2.0 of the underground magnetic model is, is really exciting because we've drill tested it twice. And we've already got the, the preliminary petrology report telling us that target area A is uh, prospective for nickel copper in particular and uh, the great red spot in the proterozoic is particularly prospective for copper so you know these are two distinct um, these are company making projects in their own right and they're 25 kilometers apart so so the, everything will all be presented when we come to release this report which i hope i think it's fair to say jeremy we're sort of nearing completion for that would you say i would agree yes Okay. Uh, I just have a point I can throw in on that as well. Uh, we, we mentioned the, the new technology that we've been perfecting, the audio magneto to lyrics. And uh, this actually comes into play for all of Kavango's projects. And, and it, it can really seriously help, we think, we can seriously help the, the nickel exploration as well, uh, in that we're, we're not simply going after conductors uh, if, if we invoke the uh, AMT technology as well. We, we can actually get a, a sense of what the stratigraphy looks like, the host rock stratigraphy, for, for the conductors and that actually will help us prioritize and make decisions. So it's, it's it seems subtle, but it's a, it's a serious leg up for us as well, technically. Mark, what I'd really like to do with some of the visuals that we're going to be showing to the market, it'd be great if, if you, Jeremy, and I could could do one of those video presentations and, and Jeremy can sort of walk you through sort of and show on the screen sort of how this works. Because he's right, it really is going to be a very exciting development for the company because I keep on saying this, we've now drill tested this. So um, we're really, really looking forward to, to, to presenting these results and then obviously expanding this across our programmes. Yep, excellent. We can certainly do a special feature. I know they are quite popular. I'm being told there are quite a few questions coming in. Um, so just bear that in mind, perhaps with the with the, the length of your answers. So the next one, uh, what's the progress on the other projects, Ditto and the KCB? Will more funding be required? Okay, so well, I've talked about the progress, I'm conscious of time. So will more funding be required? That's obviously everyone wants to know that. So we built a very scalable business model. We've, we run a very lean ship, so we can run on a very limited budget, but what we've concentrated very hard on over the last 12 months is getting ready to scale up. So our financing strategy has been, I think, quite innovative. We've put in place um, excellent warrant packages to give ourselves you know, more runway based on success. A lot of those warrants are in the money at the moment at two and a half pence. We have another big bank at 4.25. So we've got quite high expectations for those. 
In terms of additional funding, um, a company like ours at some point, yeah, probably will look to come to the market. But for the time being, we've got plenty of cash in the bank. We've had quite a few warrants that have exercised this year already. But our main focus is actually going to be looking at the project level. So I talked earlier on about making the project partner ready. We've got some very, very specific ideas of a strategy that we're going to pursue to start to bring partners, plural, into this project um, to help us uh, take it forward. And as part of those deals, we'd be looking to uh, structure it to see us have some of our well, a large chunk of the exploration the expenditure um, that we've spent to date being refunded to us. And then, of course, sort of sharing the costs of the programs moving forward. So we're looking at sort of a number of different packages that we can pursue. But for the time being, our main focus is the next phase of exploration is fully funded. We're going to crack on with the TDEM in the KSZ. We're already drilling down at Ditow, as I said, and up at the KCB. Uh, we're, we're zoning in on those those next those drill targets, knowing where to do the first fence lines of, of, of drills. So yeah, it's all, all happening at the moment. We're, we're fine for the time being. At some point, I expect, yes, but we're looking at other alternatives as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Now, Ben, very soon has, a, has used a lot, very soon has been used a lot, but not very specific. What is the time? This is one of my favorite people on Twitter. Hi there, how are you doing? Um, look, I, I get it. You you are you're losing patience. I do understand. And there have been times when I have been a bit over over ambitious. There are, there are things that I've wanted to happen more quickly. Part of the challenge with my job is that you know I'm I'm a natural communicator. I'm very passionate about what we do and I'm very eager about it. And sometimes that has got the better of me. I, I do recognize that. We made a couple of missteps this year in terms of our comms. Um, we had that little period of uh, news blackout. We've just got to put our hands up to that. That was a mistake. We should have told the market that we you know, weren't under an obligation to do it because it was an operational delay. But I think we should have told the market, you know, as soon as we got the drill rig going, exactly what had happened, just so that people knew. Because, of course, what then happened with the result itself, the result itself was unclear, was very technically a real sort of head scratcher, wasn't it, Jeremy? I mean, we spent sort of a good week just figuring out what on earth was going on and eventually obviously managed to get the answers. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I understand about very soon. So I'll, I'll be much more careful about using very soon. But at the same time, you know, you do have to be patient with a program like this. It's a very, very big and pro complex project. So it just does take time. Okay. And, and you, you have to do things properly as well. I mean, I think that's, yeah. that's, that's part of the Kavango corporate culture now is, is really make an effort to make sure everything's technically very sound. And uh, so sometimes that will seem like we're delaying, but uh, I think we're just trying to get it right. Okay. Absolutely. And that, and I, yeah, I just, can I just add to that as well? I mean, in terms of the corporate culture at Kavango and how thorough we are with everything, I mean, that's been a big change in the business over the last 12 months. And I think that when we come to release everything, it, I believe it will all make sense. So just, just bear with us. Okay. Okay. Now, you've mentioned a joint venture, our CAV at this stage. Well, like I, I said earlier, we're going to be talking much more about being partner ready. Um, so in terms of a JV for a major company at this stage, I think it is still a little premature. But we're looking at a number of other alternatives, which we think are going to be viable to take us to that stage. Uh, we've had a few discussions with very large firms. We've got a few NDAs that are in place. It's nothing to get too excited about at this stage because this is like fairly sort of common practice. Um, but we are working, we're working towards that as we speak. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Will you consider using an option such as primary bid uh, if you go for funding so existing private investors can participate? Yeah, so I, I think for, for if we do do something again, then yeah, we would look at that. Um, it was on the last raise we did over a weekend. It was done very, very quickly. Um, I, you know, the primary bid service is an excellent service. It does give retail investors the chance to participate. I've also got a few other ideas of, of how we might be able to, to let our shareholders in in the event that we do raise money. But like I said, at the moment, we've had warrant conversions already coming in. Cash balance is really healthy. Um, Current uh, drill program is both a combination of equity and cash that we've paid up front, um, and yeah, everything else is fully funded because it's now really sort of desk desktop work for the for the foreseeable future as we as we work with uh, the data that comes in from Caslotter and the TDEM surveys. Okay, okay, thank you. How far is the hole in detail now? Is it carbonatite your geologist is looking at in the last Twitter post? Well, I'm obviously not going to answer that question because that would be price sensitive. Um, look, it's all progressing to plan. If there are any serious problems, we would have reported those. One of the challenges with sort of looking for carbonatites is they are very complex geological structures. In fact, Jeremy, maybe you could say a bit about that and sort of the, the complexity of the environment we're working in. 
Well, yes, th this is certainly key to the sort of proof of concept program that we've commenced with the towers is, uh, you know, can we determine if we have uh, carbonatic rocks there or, or can, can we find uh, uh, alteration that's related to a carbonatite? So that's, that is the tricky part and it has to be done properly. And, um, uh, you know, essentially uh, you have to find out what's down there. Now, these things are also zoned, you know, typically they're, uh, carbonatites are circular, they've got uh, rings around them, so the, the rings of zonation, uh, those can relate to different rock types, different alteration types. So it, it can be tricky, it's got to be done right, and uh, that, that, that is the challenge that we're, we're uh, addressing right now. Absolutely, and I think in terms of reporting on it, the simple answer is we just don't know, because like Jeremy said, these are complex, tricky systems that we're dealing with, and I think probably what we'll need to rely on will be the actual assay testing, so as soon as we've got the core out of the ground, mm -hmm. We'll move on to the next hole and, and start to send uh, um, uh, rock core off for, for assay testing because what's important about this campaign is obviously as proof of concept we're looking to test ultimately these 12 structures so the more we can learn as we go along that's going to guide future decision making while while the drill rig is in the field so so at this stage again this is i think for detail just just bear with us and, and we'll report sort of as and when we have anything that's definitively reportable that we've thoroughly tested and have, you know followed the what's now the robust Cavango report approach. Okay. Uh, I'd make one other point if I could jump in. Uh, yeah, I think really this is just the first hole as well. And we, we've got to let this program run. Uh, I don't think we're going to prove up anything with one hole per carbonatite. We, we've got at least a couple of holes per carbonatite target so far. We've got uh, I think a total of 12 carbonatite targets in the area. So uh, I, I think you have to bear with Curbango on this and just let this program run for a few holes and, and then see how this progresses. Um, I, I, you're not going to get something with one hole necessarily. And it's also going to be a bit of a learning curve too. Um, you know, we'll, we'll maybe hit something in the third hole that uh, um, um, elucidates what the geology is like in the area, and then sort of things open, open up for us in terms of learning and understanding. Okay, and just just on the complexity of of the area, Jeremy, um, what is your experience in 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 the area, and wh why are you the man for the job? Can I ask? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, well, I, I've uh, I've started off my career working in Botswana. Um, uh, it was 1994. It was a long time ago now, and uh, um, you know, made several trips in the country. Uh, I've actually been out in these areas, uh, camp camped on the Great Red Spot, things like that, and um, uh, never worked on carbonatites in Botswana because I was working on kimberlites, and, and the carbonatites at the time were considered a bit of a nuisance. And, but now, with the advent of rare earth elements, uh, they're interesting. And so I've, I've actually worked on carbonatites uh, in in, uh, in Canada and uh, looked in other parts of the world. So, uh, you know, as, as the uh, economic cycles move, uh, priorities change for interesting commodities. And, and my career has uh, always shifted from uh, various target types and commodity types. So it's been a tremendous uh, learning experience over the past 27 years. And uh, that that is the experience that I'm, I'm bringing to Canada. Okay. And and Ben, a similar question to you. It's the first year as CEO. Do you see it as a successful one for the company? And what, what have you learned in your time doing this? Uh, what have I learned? I was introduced, um, actually, to the, uh, what was the name of that principal you taught me about, Jeremy? The uh, learning experience, uh, where you think you know everything, and then you suddenly discover you don't. Oh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger. I've learned all yeah, about yeah. the Dunning-Kruger uh, Kruger effect. So no, I mean it's been it's been one hell of a, a learning experience over the last twelve months. It's been extremely hard work. Um, the company it did need a lot of love, um, sort of operationally. There was a lot that needed to be improved. Um, you know, even down to some of like the really most basic stuff. We didn't have a proper database in place. Um, I've obviously been very fortunate that we've been well funded. So I've been able to approach people like Jeremy, like John Lauderdale, Brett Grist, Tips, uh, Ingrisani, who have come in. And these guys have obviously, you know, they've brought in all of their experience within the industry, within the sector to help us obviously improve the business significantly. Uh, the drill programs, of course, um, have been extremely complicated. But again, we're working with the right people. Where Mindea, those guys, you know, they've really put in a series of shifts for us and, and done fantastic work. And then finally, spectral geophysics. That was another deal that I secured for the company, that strategic relationship with Kaz Lotta. I mean, it's great being able to pick up the phone and talk to Kaz. He's got so much experience of, of, of these types of uh, the technical sort of remote surveying in this region. So I've learned, I've been very, very fortunate to learn from really talented, really experienced people. In terms of the business itself, I think we are light years ahead of where we were 12 months ago. I know that's not reflected at the moment in the share price, but the performance that I see on the ground, 
as I think really demonstrated by the fact that we really transitioned very smoothly from the um, drill campaign up in the KSZ immediately down to detail, two completely different projects. Cavango's never done anything like that before. And that's the culture I now want in the business. I want us to approach our, pro our projects aggressively in the right way, very ambitiously as well. We want to keep the drill bit turning as much as we can. And I think if you look at Cavango's performance now, you know, you, the, the signs are all there. We really are starting to work through our ground much, much quicker and much, much better than we did before. And I think the next few announcements that will come up will really sort of illustrate and highlight just quite, you know, what a different beast we are. Okay. Well, we are pretty much up on your time. I just see one question has popped in there. I'll just ask that before we take a break. Should you should do a presentation on the developments of where you started and what you have found, how things develop? What do you think to that? Well, we've just done that, Mark, haven't we? I'm going to be on your uh, <laughs> I'm going to be on your um, on your podcast, aren't I? Very soon. Yes, on the special features. Well, we have a podcast with you that will be going out on Monday. Yes, the Market Musings podcast will be going out where we have a long format discussion with with you, Ben, and we will sit down and do that special feature with both you and Jeremy. So unless there are any more final questions, we are up on the time yeah. for uh, Kavango here. So um, if any have been missed, I promise that we will collate them and we'll put them to Ben or Jeremy uh, over the course of the next week and, and get them answered. But uh, for now, sir, thank you very much, Ben Turney and Jeremy Brett, for your time. Uh, we'll take another quick two-minute break and we'll be back with uh, George Rote of Premier African Minerals. Thanks very much for having us, Mark. It's a great format. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome back to Stockbox Premier and our last guest tonight from Premier African Minerals, George Roach, the CEO. Good evening, George. Welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And it's good to be chatting to you, Mark. Yes, thank you very much, George, for your time this evening. So today we're going to be focusing on the company's Zulu Lithium project, which is, of course, your 100% own lithium deposit in Namibia. So yes. the Zulu Lithium project yes. is widely regarded as one of the biggest lithium bearing pegmatites in Zimbabwe. Given that only approximately 35% of the 3.5 kilometer strike has been explored, does Zulu have the potential to be a tier one world-class deposit? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, it does have that potential. Um, and various of our exploration geos over the past four or five years have uh, reached that conclusion. Um, we've, we've really only explored a very small component 
um, of this. The the tenement is broken down between a claims area, which was the original Zulu deposit, approximately three and a half kilometers or so, and um, a much larger exclusive prospecting order area, uh, which we know is on strike, and uh, there are various other targets within that that have already been identified. Um, preliminary work is underway. Uh, some uh, some remote sensing work has been done. Some on the ground work has been done in those areas, and all of it's very positive. Um, so uh, yes, we've declared uh, previously exploration targets that are significant, um, and the, the work today uh, is to move uh, from exploration targets and from uh, inferred. Uh, resources into um, mineable uh, resource and clearly defined ore bodies that uh, we're comfortable we can go out and mine and uh, know sufficient about to create uh, and build successful and profitable mine mines perhaps coming uh, out of that area. So the answer to that is yes, uh, that, that's, that still is the case without, without a doubt. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's good to hear. Now, of course, the recent twelve million pound <laughs> DFS funding was excellent news for the business, considering the current market conditions. Can you tell investors what the planned use of these funds are? Sure. Well, I, I think the the first thing, the first point to make is that this was made as a direct investment into Premier, um, and. Uh, use and allocation of the funds and so on is, is really at Premier's discretion, but is predominantly intended to advance the Zulu project. Now, I think what's a little bit more significant than the investment is who made the investment and uh, the associations uh, that relate to it. And I think one needs to consider that uh, the investor is in fact the 75% shareholder um, of what is today the second largest uh, lithium hydroxide um, conversion processor in China, and they expect to be number one by the end of this year. And the 25% partner is um, CATL, the major battery manufacturers. So their requirement for spodumene is insatiable at the moment. And the, the, there, is, there, there is a concerted effort in Prem and coming from our, our new investors to do what we can to attempt to advance Zulu uh, to a point where there is production as quickly as is possible. Now, the, the, the investment has effectively allowed us to shift our focus a little and um, up until the point that that investment was made, uh, we were periodically funding on, on placement. Um, I had taken a view that said I'd prefer to keep 100% uh, of this project for Prem. Uh, we're, we're uncertain as to where the price of body means going to go, quite what a real value is. If you're going to do some kind of a sellout, uh, at what price was the right price and uh, doing and agreeing terms uh, in um, – in September last year uh, would have been perceived to have been a, a terrible deal by the time you got to the end of December or into January. So I, I, I think that we took the right decision there. Um, so with this investment coming in, with where Spodumin has moved to at the moment, uh, there, there is a significant amount of de-risking in terms of looking at rapid advancement of projects, simply by virtue of the price of the commodity that you're producing. And, and if we relate that to the fact that Prem uh, was committed and remains committed to a definitive feasibility study and is well into that process. Uh, but if you, if you consider that uh, a DFS, amongst other things, de-risks what it is that you're trying to do and uh, says to you or says to a financier that uh, this is a project you can go ahead and finance with confidence. Well, there are a couple of things now that relate. First of all, um, I don't believe that Premier is in a situation where we've got to go and start trying to talk to a bank to come and finance us. 
uh, we have an investor who is associated with what is going to be the biggest uh, um, lithium hydroxide converter who's desperately looking for product. Uh, and it, all the indications are that uh, what funding is needed when it comes to do a build is going to be available. And it's going to be available on a, on a debt offset uh, uh, takeoff basis. So I, I think from a prem shareholder perspective, that's potentially great news if that is how this develops. So coming back to the DFS and the de-risking de -risking concept and which way one goes, um, you know, if, if, if I think that when we did our scoping study, we were sitting at a spodumene price of $800 a ton, um, and we felt that we were profitable, and uh, uh, spodumene was $800, and I think Petlight was $400, and so on. We're now sitting in a situation where some of the spodumene prices I'm seeing are into the $5,000 a ton mark. Um, the margin and the flexibility and the ability to reassess how you're going to deal with the risks associated with building a plant and getting it into production quickly are completely different uh, to where you were uh, six months, nine months ago. Uh, similarly, when it comes to your actual pit and what you're going to mine, uh, your cutoff grades are a moving target. That cutoff grade changes almost every time the price of spodumene goes up. The cutoff grade drops, the ability to go and look for more in the pit that you can mine, the ability to be less efficient, not that we want to be less efficient, but the ability to be less efficient in your actual mining, your whole mining scenario uh, starts to to be to become something that that is is pretty significant. So, the investment has allowed us almost to refocus and to uh, to to and remember also that this is this investment is is probably only five six weeks old now. So it's 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 pretty new and there's a hell of a lot that's happening in the last five six weeks. But it's allowing us uh, to take a completely fresh look at what we really need to be able to move to a far quicker point of perhaps having some mine construction as opposed to uh, having to continue to go down the route of a traditional DFS. So there's a compromise between these two. And the compromise probably lies in a large size pilot plant, for example. Um, and, and this is the kind of strategy that we're exploring at the moment. So there is no definitive decision. I haven't said that neither has the company or the board taken a decision, decision to go one way or, or, or another. But it does seem that uh, the potential exists to bring in a significantly sized pilot plant operation that could easily be revenue generative and in a much shorter time period than completion of a full traditional DFS, de-risk down to a, a plus minus 5 to 10% kind of level, which one would normally go and look at. There are, there are some risks that obviously you have to assess. You have to know that you've got a process that can work, that you have to know. You have to know that you have a clearly defined measured and indicated area of your resource that you can immediately go and mine. You have to know what the mineral assemblage within that specific area is. Those are things you need to know. Uh, but one is then able to fashion around that with perhaps a lot more latitude than may have been the case six months, nine months, a year ago, or whenever. So that's the kind of thing that this investment has brought to us. Um, and I, I think that that over the next couple of weeks or so, uh, there's going to be a fine-tuning of some of this thinking. Um, we're already uh, adjusting a whole lot of things at site. Um, for example, uh, we've, we've pulled back all six rigs that are operating. That's six rigs operating at Zulu at the moment. I mean, we've drilled over 13,000 meters uh, in, the last, in the last eight, nine months. Um, 
we've got huge uh, quantities of of um, materials still to prepare in sample. We've got probably another seven, eight hundred assays that, that are outstanding at the moment. But we've been able to pull our rigs into a tight formation around where we want to mine initially with the, the uh, intention that we can have measured and indicated very quickly uh, that can support this kind of conversation that our partners are now pushing us toward. So strategically different kind of strategy that is beginning to emerge. The thinking is there. Uh, it, it's, it hasn't happened yet, but that is the direction that our thinking and our strategy is beginning to move in. And as soon as there is something definitive coming out of that, obviously this will go into uh, uh, formal market advice and market news and be properly supported and so on and so forth. So, you know, I hope that assists you with that one. I hope so. Yes, a long, a long answer, but, but thank you, George, very comprehensive. So what I am going to do is, is uh, actually go to the floor in, uh, in a few moments. Sure. But there were some questions actually that were sent to me directly that I did promise I would try to get. It was 14 sent to me and I promised yes. I would try to ask at least some of them. Sure. <laughs> um, and then we'll, we'll have to go to the, to the live Q&A as well. Of course, that's what we're here for. So the first one I have is how many holes or meters have been sent for sampling for Zulu and how many uh, have been received back from the lab? Well, let, let me say generally, so I'm going to give you a bit of a summary. Let me give you a bit of a summary on the whole the whole drilling scenario. Um, we got six rigs drilling. This this is all stuff that's out in the in the public domain generally. We got six rigs drilling. Uh, we've done over thirteen thousand meters at the moment. Our rigs are primarily centered right now on dealing with elevating uh, what we hope to be the mineable resource area into measured and indicated from a whole lot of inferred. Um, we're no longer no longer chasing the extensions right now. We want to have this, this heart and soul that we can start mining. Um, we've we've <laughs> We've probably got, well, we have got the better part of 2,000 um, samples that have either been sent, uh, some results in many still to come. But one of the other things that I have done, and I'm, this is in the context of drilling, is that I've changed uh, part of the management structure uh, at Zulu. And I've called for a complete review of everything that had been done over the last nine, 10 months at site. Uh, and that review is progressing well. Uh, the results that we're hearing and seeing, uh, what people are saying to me are generally good. But I wanted to be absolutely certain that in every respect, we were completely compliant, that we were not gonna face any criticisms anywhere, that we would be able to uh, provide uh, this mineable resource, my terminology, uh, that allows us to perhaps follow the strategy that I've been discussing. So uh, I've held back uh, in any further updates in terms of uh, resource and drilling results pending that review, which is now coming to an end. So okay. there will be there will be updates on that. Um, okay. Okay. So approximately two thousand meters, but there will be an update out in the near term. Uh, yeah, I saw somebody else got into trouble on that one earlier. So I'm not using any imminence or any soon yeah. or any any of those. I got okay. I got a few others of those as well that we can look at. But but no, uh, but, but okay. yes. Yes, there will be okay. updates. Okay. And uh, how many additional holes or meters are envisaged as being required to complete the Zulu DFS? Is the target still 60 to 80 million tons indicated? No, we've never had a target of 60 to 80 million tons indicated. The 60 to 80 million tons was a declared exploration target some time ago. Uh, that was an exploration target. Samrec code-compliant exploration target. Um, now, 
how much of that and how much of new extensions converts, first of all, into inferred, and then from inferred into indicated and indicated into measured, uh, that's a work in progress. Okay, okay. And the other question I have, and I think it did pop up on the screen, but it's, I think it's the same question. When do you expect the Zulu DFS to be completed? Again, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult question. But well, let's, given... let's, yeah, let's go back to the, to the earlier discussion that we had. Our target, our target for completion of the Zulu DFS had originally been um, probably early Q3 this year, round about there, Q3 there or thereabouts. I, I have to say that we've had exceptional rains in Zimbabwe and in the whole SADC region. I think it's been on news all over the world. There's been huge, huge, huge rains. The COVID situations and so on haven't really helped us. Um, need, needless to say, uh, most of the components that relate to a DFS are pretty well in place uh, right now. Um, and, and kind of each day there's more that comes through. So if we were to not change strategy, and simply remain focused absolutely on completing a DFS, uh, I think that we would probably make some time during Q3. Um, I think that would, that's a reasonably safe estimate at the moment. Um, I temper it with uh, a discussion on, on, on how well fine-tuned one wants the costs. Go back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, with the huge margin that exists at the moment because of spodumene pricing, uh, maybe you can uh, bring forward uh, a DFS timeline by not refining your overall cost structures down to uh, plus minus 5 to 10 and come in at something like 15 to 20, uh, which under the present circumstances uh, I think would be found to be very acceptable with spodumene pricing, as is. So, in in summary, if we focus on the DFS, we'd probably be within the timelines. Uh, whether that's the right strategy at the moment is a different situation. Yeah, why would you not focus on the DFS, I guess, would be the, the next question. <laughs> well, let's deal with that. Uh, if if, if uh, a, a, a simple... Um, uh, large-scale pilot plant uh, facility that could produce at, I don't know, five tons of spot, you mean an hour? Something like that. Work that one out on a continuous basis, and your flotation side works best when it's continuous. Um, that, that kind of thing could make a bit of money. Okay. <laughs> now, if that's what somebody is saying to us, and they're saying, there's the money, we'll lend you the money, and we have a flow sheet that's proven, that's gone through test work, uh, that we're all comfortable with, that can work. Uh, uh, is there a reason for not going down that route? So mm -hmm. you know, there you go. Question with a question. Yeah, that's indeed. the strategy issue that we're dealing with at the moment. Okay. So I believe there are quite a few questions. So just bear that in mind. We've probably got five to ten minutes, uh, sure. George, with you. Uh, so a question that's coming on you said, what volume can be produced from a pilot plant? Well, <laughs> that, that's kind of how long is a piece of string in some ways. Um, look, I, I think, let me let me say, uh, and, and again, it's always been out there. It's been discussed way back from 2017 and onwards. Um, we, we believe strongly in uh, the need to, to adequately sort ore from, uh, from the mining operation. Um, and we sent a, a large sample to Germany um, late last year which was intended for sensor-based sorting. Now, <coughs> looking at some of the sensor-based sorting, and it's not completely final yet, but looking at some of the preliminary results on sensor-based sorting, um, you, 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 can, you can actually throw quite a lot of ore at, a, at, a, at sensor-based sorters and pull out a reasonably good division of lithium minerals. Um, so... I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it would be inordinate to expect somewhere between three and five ton an hour, maybe, from a okay. pilot plant. Okay. Um, okay. 
I think it's important to say that a pilot plant would also form part of a DFS as well in many ways. Uh, whilst it will be producing, uh, at the same time, we would not be processing petalite. We'd be stockpiling it. We would not be producing uh, tantalum. Uh, we would we would we would stockpile. Uh, we would continuously fine tune uh, as a pilot plant uh, operates. Um, the the other the other interesting, just as an aside on this, uh, is that recently we did make an announcement in regard to some other claim areas that we have in the eastern part of Zimbabwe. Now those are generally more scattered and smaller. We don't expect them to be necessarily the size of Zulu, although big. And those are the kinds of claims that would have huge potential for a pilot plant concept similar to this discussion and this perhaps change strategy that we're looking at. Um, okay. Okay. So some multiple opportunities there, maybe. Okay. Are Prem committed to building a mine or will it sell Zulu if there is enough commercial interest? And Would Prem consider an auction to achieve the best price? No, I, I, we're, we're completely committed um, to going ahead and, and seeing this into production. Um, having said that, uh, anything is for sale at the right price. Hmm. Um, I, I have a view that by being committed to take something into production, if there is going to be some kind of a buyout and some kind of an offer, it's much more likely to come when you demonstrate what, what it is that you've been saying you can do and actually do it. Um, so from that point of view, I think the commitment to go down this, this road remains the correct commitment for the company. But okay. you know, okay. anything's for sale at the right price. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at the questions that are popping up through the live chat. It sounds like if we went down the pilot plant route, our plant could be up and running this year. Is that a fair assumption? Mm, not necessarily. Um, I, I don't want to make any commitments uh, in terms okay. of that sort of timeline. Um, you know, once let the strategy play out, uh, I'd like to see it develop a little bit. I'd like to do a little bit more work. Um, and that's the kind of question I could I could answer, I think, uh, in another couple of weeks' time. Okay. Super. Thank you for I'd that. Obviously love to, I'd obviously love to see it happen, but I can't give mm. a positive answer to that at the moment. Give me a few weeks. Sure. George, have you had any contact from Tesla? No, David, I haven't. But... Uh, uh, I believe that uh, CATL are manufacturing their batteries anyway. So, you know, maybe this is a bit of indirect contact already. Okay, so Elon Musk hasn't been to visit. Is the uh, resource pegmatite or petalite? Well, it's a pegmatite. Um, and the pegmatite contains various different mineral assemblages. The mineral assemblage has spodumene, it has petalite. It has some lipidolite, um, and there's some various, uh, there's a thing called Holmquistite, and uh, we can come up with a few more exotics as well. But <clears throat> the concern is uh, that we would like it to be predominantly uh, spodumene. That's the mineral that has the highest lithium percentage, so that's what it is. But the overall general ore body is referred to as being a pegmatite and then okay. it is mineralized or not. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Can we please have an update on the Rus for Zulu? When when we can expect findings in EPO which can be communicated, how many further projects we expect to set up in EPO? Well, I think we've dealt with a lot of that already. The last part of it, how many more projects can we expect to set up within the EPI? I don't know. It's a work in progress. I mean, there's a, there's, there's, as, I, as I've said, I've, I've just pulled back all the rigs. I've got six rigs. Uh, I mean, the, these, these things in, spa, in places are working at 25 meter centers. You know, we, we really are determined to get uh, uh, significant uh, indicated and hopefully measured as well out of it. Uh, that'll spread out into the rest of the EPO area in time. 
Okay, okay. Do you have any idea when we might have enough resource in the indicated category to consider the pilot plant strategy? I hope that's within the next couple of weeks. Okay, good, excellent. Nice short answer. I didn't say imminent and I didn't say soon either. <laughs> that's what I hope. That's what I'm, what I'm working very hard to achieve. And go back to one of the earlier questions you asked. This is one of the critical components to okay. taking that decision and following that kind of strategy. Okay, okay. Can you give us an update? What's the latest on RHA? RHA remains in a negotiation with the government. Um, okay. I mean, it's, I... We 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 did do some additional resource work, uh, reassessment of the resource not that long ago. Um, we have some additional drill targets. We believe that there is a very good potential to bring this thing back uh, on a large scale, um, semi underground, open pit kind of concept, um, mining some of the other load structures. Uh, but the, the, this ownership issue has got to be resolved. It's with okay. the Minister of Mines. We've met with him recently. I'm confident that he will deal with it. And uh, I, it, it's it's ludicrous that it stands as it is. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. When is the much-anticipated Rus due? <laughs> <laughs> we've we've had that question in all sorts yes. of different different ways. We have, we've have had that question in, not, in a number of different. I'm not areas. I'm not going to answer that question yet because uh, I want to complete this complete review, and sure. I want it to be focused exclusively on getting this mineable ore body that I allows us to see whether our, our revised strategy can be more than a strategy and can really work. Okay. okay. Uh, you know that's really where that is. Okay. Can you give us the latest on the LIBS system? Has it been abandoned? No. 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 no the LIBS will be uh, will be a very important component okay. um, of Zulu as it progresses and goes forward. We are not using it right now for assays, but it will be a very important part and component of what okay. we're doing. Okay. Uh, I saw the question. Did you find anything at RHA you were talking about last year? Well, I think I've just covered that just now. Um, I think we understand what we want to do uh, mm -hmm. with RHA. I think we understand where the future lies at RHA. Um, you know, Wolframite's in a good place at the moment. That price is good. And it's a pity that RHA isn't resolved. Uh, but I think I think that'll come. I think it's going to happen. Okay, okay. And is there any latest news on MNH? Has MNH started making its loan repayments? And if not, what action is being taken to recover monies due? No, no, MNH is not. Um, I, 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 I must say that I don't think I can do anything more with MNH until. I properly conclude discussions with our new investors. Um, we obviously have the cash right now to be able to effectively do whatever we need to do with M&H. Uh, is it the right decision or isn't it? Um, that's something that I've got to discuss with others. Uh, okay. So, no, nothing has been done with M&H right now, but I we're going to bring it to a head pretty soon, one way or okay. another. And is there a reason why Prem have not issued any drilling results in the past nine and a half weeks? Well, I've just said we're completely reviewing everything. You're completely reviewing. I've, yeah. I've changed the team and I'm going through a complete review of everything. Okay. okay. Well, we'll await to, to see that, George. Uh, very pleased with the interview today. Thank you, George. Sounds like an exciting few months ahead of us. So, uh, so well, I, I, you know. Mark, I must tell you, I didn't, I didn't email to to our senior staff earlier today, um, and it really related. It was just confirming some of what we've been talking about now, um, and and I said to them, this is going to be like a whirlwind. Uh, okay. the, the next the next five or six or seven months in Prem is going to be beyond belief busy. Not that we 
kind of don't know where we are at the moment for being too busy, but nevertheless, it's going to get worse or better. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Hopefully, we'll be talking quite a lot then. So we are up on the time. We are going to start to head towards our sort of roundtable discussion with, with all of our guests. Is there any final questions uh, for George that, to see if they pop up? Uh, if not, then here we go. Here we go. Oh, how many no, loan we've repayments? We've had that one. Yeah, we've covered that one. We've definitely covered that one. Um, but so if that is everything for George, uh, let me just check on my sheet that was given here earlier. Okay, is there an update on Circum as the last question? What's the latest uh, on Circum? Um, I, I think just a general comment on Circum. I think yeah. that particularly with what's happening with this this whole saga uh, with Russia, Ukraine, and so on, um, we've all seen where uh, some of the fertilizer prices have gone. Mm -hmm. um there 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 is a need there has been a revised um a dfs done uh for circum and this requires that there is an, an amended mining plan approved now i'm not quite sure whether that mining plan has yet been approved uh i believe that it will there is there is also a general agreement amongst the major shareholders and i think i think we're all aware of the uh, consolidation of some of the minorities at the moment, which actually puts us in a much much stronger position than we were in before, um, and and there's a there's a, a general consensus uh, that within a certain period of time, uh, this thing will be taken public, uh, and uh, the company itself will proceed, uh, or it will find an industry partner, or there will be a a sale or whatever. Um, but there is a, a very strong and concerted effort and agreement amongst the shareholders to deal with this liquidity situation, uh, liquidity okay. events situation ASAP. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, George Roach, the CEO of Premier African Minerals. If there are any questions that we have missed, uh, as I said before, we will get them sorted over the next week directly with George, either through an interview or through a written piece. But what I'd like to do now, just for the last 20 minutes, is to bring everyone back in. So welcome back, Ben Turney and Robbie McRae. Um, and we can hopefully just have a little bit of a sort of round table discussion. Mark, so the first room for Jeremy as well. I think Jeremy was coming Yes, in. I think we can add Jeremy in. Yeah. There we go. There's Jeremy. Thanks. Everyone is in, everyone is in, excellent. So just looking at the sector and its cyclical nature and given the move towards electrification of vehicles and the shift towards a green carbon neutral economy powered by the renewable energy and battery storage, what are your feelings on a boom in the mining commodities sector, which we may be seeing the early signs of given price fluctuations in certain commodities and multiple years of underinvestment in the space. Uh, ben, can I come to you first on that? What are your thoughts on a mining commodity sector oh, boom? Is it due? You've answered your own question there, Mark. I mean, everything you've, <laughs> everything you've described there, we've got perfect conditions. Um, we've got this almost unprecedented divergence between commodity prices and particularly the, the, the small, the, the, the more junior stocks from sort of exploration through to smaller uh, development plays. And at some point that gap is going to have to close. So the only, the only question investors really need to ask themselves is which one or two things do they think is going to happen? Do they think either commodity prices are going to drop substantially because they really would have to drop substantially or our equity is going to rise? And for, my, for what it's worth, my view is that we're going to see a bull market possibly like we've never seen before in this space. I know that there was the, the glory days of 2008, 9, 10 um, was, was, a, was a great period, but uh, we could be on the cusp of something really quite incredible now. Okay, okay. Well, Robbie, let me get your thoughts on that. I know your, your company is into gold rather than uh, commodities or metals that might be used in this space, but what are your, what are your thoughts on a, on a mining commodities sector bull cycle? Yeah, I mean, um, gold gold store still a tremendous a tremendous store of value. You know, all the all the classic old things, the in, the inflation hedges, the the the, the, the safe place to go. Um, we've the, the gold price has been moving between since we bought Kilima Pesa between two thousand down to eighteen hundred, back up to two thousand, flitting around eighteen fifty at the moment. So it, it's it, it's not running like the other metals. Um, I'm, I'm an I'm an investor in, in in quite a few of the stocks. I'm a bit of an investor in in, in prem, etc. So yeah, um, 
It's not in Cav, times. Robbie. Not, in, not an investor in Cav. Uh, after listening to you tonight, <laughs> after listening to you tonight, I, I've, I'm, I'm going to take a look. I'm going to take a look. I, 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 the, I'm an accountant. The, the, the heavy scientific stuff I don't really understand, but it, it's um, that's why Jeremy's it's, here. <laughs> those deep holes that you are drilling sound exciting. <laughs> excellent. Okay. Sorry, excellent. Well, Ro Robbie might not have much money left after his director purchase, but uh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. I'm, I'm still okay. I can still do do a few, but no, I, I, I'm very bullish. I mean, the the gold sector is probably the most boring sector out there at the moment. I mean the the platinum palladium side is flying um base metals are flying zinc copper you name it um mm. rare earths going crazy uh, lithium's gone absolutely ballistic you look at companies like lake resources these guys i mean it's it's, it's massive so gold we kind yeah. of just chugging along but no, it, it's definitely exciting times yeah okay and george of course what, what are your feelings then being being in lithium well <laughs> you know let, let me say long may it last um, <clears throat> I, 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 I do think that there'll be just talking specifically about lithium. I mean, it's a very common element, but I think that, um, it's going to stabilize, but it's going to stabilize, uh, at a price much higher than its previous kind of stabilization level. Um, I think that, uh, we're in, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so carefully looking at a strategy of trying to get something uh, produced very quickly and go with a large scale pilot plant type thing I can ramp up um, uh, because I think it's the right thing to do right now. And I think that whatever you establish now uh, in the mining space will be there for the long term. So this is as much an opportunity now to uh, benefit and profit from uh, the commodity boom that may be there but for those of us who are in development stages uh, to actually bring something into production, because these mines generally have got a habit of producing through thick and thin once they're there and they're producing and working. Um, so I think that that's a secondary opportunity that exists with all of us on this call at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, Generally, I get the feeling that we're all bullish then on the mining and commodities space. So uh, let's uh, let's hope that uh, that does indeed uh, come 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 to fruition. I just want to take us now on to ESG. That's environmental and social governance. Of course, this plays a large part in the development of a discovery and its path towards production. Now, all of you operate in Africa. How critical is ESG to the success of a project in Africa? And what are the best ways to approach it? And Robbie, let me ask you first on that. What are your thoughts? Um, we, we have to sign a, 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 a community development license um, uh, here in Kenya, which deals, and you, and you contractually committed to a lot of the ESG functions. Um, we've, we signed off on that a while ago. Um, we're involved in small things like tree planting around, around all the schools within our area. Um, involved in the building of the schools in the area normal things that mining companies have been doing for years and years and years we we, we put in boreholes you know provide water um, cattle dipping uh, sports facilities for some of the schools around um so we, we've done the basic side and, and and that really was off the bat of our um male chauvinistic mining team that arrived on site first we making a bigger push into the ESG side. We've, we've, we've got Rachel Johnson on our board, an ESG specialist, and Sheila, who sits in our, um, in our office in, in Nairobi, and they've, they're forming an ESG team, and, and, and they'll roll out more serious ESG stuff going forward for us over the last, going forward over the next 12 months. I mean, the, the hardcore miners did their best, but the, now, now, now we've got a proper ESG team in place here. Um, okay. And on the power side, I guess that's that, that that's one of the, the the wins that we've got from the government here in Kenya. Is we 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 run a mine of geothermal power, um, and that, so that's pretty clean power. We'd like it to be more reliable. We still have to have the diesel gensets on standby. So we we, we get seventy percent reliability out of the geothermal. Get more reliability out of that. It would it would it would, it would be great. But no, we we we're, we're working hard and we're working hard with the stakeholders, and we've we've put some key people into the roles to. To, to improve 
Okay, okay. And George, what are your thoughts? You're actually well versed in uh, in ESG. Yeah, look, I mean, personally, I've had exposure um, <coughs> in so many different African countries uh, in regard to this. And, and I, you know, I, I hear everything that has just been said, and that's all correct. Um, my start point and focal point has, has always been to try and get as close to the people who are directly affected and or associated with and or involved in whatever the operation may be. Um, it's, it's, it's them that... Uh, that will feel the benefit or feel the pain, whichever way it's going to go. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I I suppose I'm a little bit more of a socialist. The older I've got, the more, more of a socialist I've become, I suppose, as well. So I think it's important in Africa to come to terms with the fact that the resource actually is the property of the government, the country, the people, and so on. And that the development uh, has to be something that uh, is seen to be beneficial, not just to you as the capital provider and the miner, but also to the 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 the, the, the people. It's this is a people thing, whatever, whichever way you want to look at it. The other the other thought that often goes through my mind is that you know us, us miners can be pretty selfish people in many ways, and. Uh, you know, if somebody says, go and build a hospital, we'll go and do it, and then give us a mining license. I'm being very simplistic in, in, what, I'm, in what I'm saying there. But, but often, often we'll do the minimum rather than uh, what we could and what maybe is closer to the maximum. The other thing that we often mm -hmm. forget is that we're a transitory situation as miners. We're not like agriculture, which is there forever. So a lot of the infrastructure that we create and the things we do are not necessarily things that will survive and benefit after we've gone. So there needs to be a, a, a very careful and considered approach taken to what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And I think the establishment, Robbie, I think you were talking about establishing a team as you have and so on, I think is such an important part of this. So, yeah. sorry. Long and complicated, but nevertheless. No, but, no. It, but it is. It's, it's important. We have, we have a dedicated person in the thing who drives it. Everybody's got to do it. But a lot of people on the mines have got, have got other jobs and they pay lip surface to it. So if you have somebody controlling it and putting it together, it's, it's important. And it achieves a lot. And, and a little can go a long way. And if you listen to the community, you can get tremendous um Tremendously positive feedback and, and, and execute some yeah, good absolutely. projects. No, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm. And then Kavango, then is it something you're looking at the moment, Ben or Jeremy? I know you're early, much earlier stage than uh, than both uh, Caracal and Premier. Do That's very important for business, um, even for a company of our size. Um, I mean, I, I worry a bit that sort of ESG is, is just a label that's being a bit overused and like Robbie just said, you know, the lip service can be paid to it by companies. They'll make sort of very grand, so George Shoy was saying, make sort of grand statements and then actually not follow through on it. Uh, what I very much believe is it's actually a case of just running a decent business and recognising that your business, it, as George was trying to explain it, it does form an important part of the local community. So invest in your people, make sure that you do sort of right by the local environment. Don't leave sort of a God awful mess behind sort of what you're doing, build community relations, get involved in support programs. I mean, we're out in the, in the desert, obviously drilling, uh, quite deep holes that can be turned into water bore holes. Those can be very useful for the local community. So just got to think a bit creatively about sort of how we can, how we can invest properly in the, in the country that we're in. And it's something that, that we as a business are very, very keen on. And we do dedicate a proportion of our annual budget towards CSR, which TIPS runs on our behalf. So uh, he's our in-country managing director and, and he, he runs our CSR budget to, to make sure that we are actually investing directly in the local economy and also local people. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd just say to you, just look after the Bushmen. No, you can shoot the elephants, but look after the Bushmen. <laughs> yeah, I don't think shooting the elephants is one of our policies. We've got so many of those things in RHA that at times you can't even get near the mine. But anyway. 
<laughs> okay, we're shooting elephants. It's like, Jeremy, do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, I would make sort of a, a general comment uh, about the mining industry in general. I, I think you know, ESG and corporate social responsibility, I mean, this is front and center to to most exploration and mining activities these days. And uh, it, it's kind of, it's make or break for companies. Uh, you know, you have to be responsible, mm -hmm. but, but I think the other way to look at it is it, it can be very win-win. You know, if you get the community on your side, if they want you to be there, if they want the jobs, or if they want to see the, the future economic development, um, it, then everyone's pulling in the same direction. And, and uh, as Robbie was saying, there, there can be real benefits from that. You know, you, what you put out to the community, you, you, you get back uh, two or three times full. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's just it's just good sound business sense, and uh, it really can be a win-win situation if the people want, want that. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the key, as George was saying. You know, um, it, it, it's up to the local community to want you there. And, and I think some some countries are very very good mining jurisdictions. They're very pro mining, and other uh, other areas they, they need a bit of convincing and uh, and good relations. And I, and I think uh, you know uh, um, you know same with good governance. If, if you keep your word on things, if you if you uh, conduct your business honorably, I think people will respect that and they they want to do business with you. Okay. Okay, thank you all. So the the final point that I just want to discuss is just on uh, how uh, you can position yourselves to when the tide comes in, let's say, that you you, you can be a speedboat rather than a, a heavy oil tanker. So setting aside making a discovery, which is, of course, transformational to a, to a mining company, when the tide does turn, when the boats rise, what are the most important elements, do you think, or work that you can be doing right now that can separate you out in the sector to become a winner George, let me go to you first. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we have to move from an exploration and development phase to a production and revenue producing phase. And that's the environment and that's the opportunity right now. Um, so that's where the focus is. That's, uh, that's the strategy that I'm hoping to implement in, in, in PREM. Okay, nice short answer. So Ben, what are, what are Kavango doing to position themselves for when the sector does turn to to be that speedboat waving waving a flag? Delivering consistency consistently, Mark. Um, okay. I think if you if you keep doing what you say you're going to do and you keep in regular communication with the market, if things go against you, you don't hide. You know, you sort of put your hand up and you sort of explain sort of why things have gone wrong. You always stay in communication with your shareholders but you just keep doing what you say you're, you're, you're going to do. You deliver on your plans. And I mean, that for us at Kavango is our, our main focus is, is our delivery. Of course, we're an earlier stage business. Um, I think one of the deciding factors for us will be to get some technical success. I think as soon as we get some technical success, the, the particular structure of our yeah. stock, as we've seen in our share price movement today, we've got a very, very tightly held um, um, shareholder register. I get my monthly section 793 requests so I can, I see sort of the, the shareholder movements that there are. We've got a very, very loyal base of shareholders. So even with 400 million shares in issue, um, they're tightly held. So it doesn't take much to get our stock going, um, as we saw them over the course of today. So I think when the tide comes to turn, if Kavango keeps on the trajectory that it's at the moment, I think we're ready to fly, you know, thanks to the work of Jeremy, Hillary, John, uh, tips, Brett, you know, we've really got the right team in place. So now all we need is just that little bit of luck, that, that little bit of technical success. And then I think you'll see us take off. Okay, excellent. So moving from explorer to producer and being consistent. Robbie, of course, you are producing at Caracal. What about being consistent? What do you think is the, the key to uh, that you can do now to uh, to unlock the value when, when the time comes? We've, we've a big focus on the exploration. You know, the, the previous owners... <clears throat> did, it, did it the wrong way around, built a great plant, put the mine in, but didn't understand the resource. So we've yeah, had a big drive on the resource to try and understand and get the answers <laughs> up, a lot better quality answers. And if we if we we know we're putting better quality answers through that mill, we know we're going to be making more money um, and it's going to be better for the community. So that, that, that that's a big focus for us at the moment. 20, 25,000 meters of drilling between now and the end of the year spot on okay so you're going you're, you're continuing to build your resource ben you're going to be consistent and hopefully have some technical success and 
George focusing on moving from explorer to producer, which is of course a, a big milestone in the company. Jeremy, do you have any any final thoughts on uh, on key things that perhaps uh, can can make you make a company stand out, or as I say, work that you can be doing right now to uh, to position ready for the uh, the upswing? Yes, I think I would add to what Ben said that uh, um, you know I think you have to have good teams. You have to have a good technical team. You have to have a good corporate team. You have to be working together. Uh, you have to be able to tap into financing, and then you have to be able to spend that money very wisely in a very technically correct fashion. Uh, so you, you have to get that exploration success. And, and uh, as George said, I think you, you have to get things into production. And uh, I, I, my sense is that the, the the tide is already rising. I think the commodities prices mm -hmm. are, are, are very hot. And I think the, the uh, uh, global geopolitical situation is such that we've got some um, uh, commodities which have come off streams and major producers in the world. So I, I think I think the time is upon us. And, and I think being able to get things right from a corporate sense and technical sense now and get that success now, I, I think uh, uh, the, the time is here. <laughs> really. Yes, I agree that the time the time is here, uh, long overdue as well. But I think mm -hmm. we are starting to see the the early signs there. Some of the the nickel price going 250% on the LME and being suspended, you know, that's that's a, a short squeeze uh, if I've ever seen one. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's definitely starting to happen. These are the first warning shots that are coming and uh, I hope uh, I hope it is about to turn. Because well, my, myself, I am an investor in the mining quantity space as well for, for many years. So Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just you've raised a really good point there. The big story on the nickel price, yes, the short squeeze grabbed all the, the headlines, but going back to what George was saying about the lithium price, Look at where nickel settled since. You know, had you told people even well six months ago, certainly a year ago, that the nickel price would be at this level, um, stocks would have taken off um, in better market conditions. Um, so I think that's the key thing to look at: is where has the price actually settled after that major spike? Mm -hmm. And I think we are in an era of much higher prices. Those baseline prices across the board, even gold, which Robbie was saying, you know, hasn't sort of taken off yet, but. Gold's still trading, what, comfortably around about $1,900 an ounce when I last saw it yeah. the other day. Yeah. You know, if you think, Robbie, from a couple of years ago, sort of, you know, that kind of price was out of, would have, you know, people would have bitten your hand off to have that. You think yeah. now the operational gearing that, that major firms have towards that price, you know, they, these yeah. companies were chucking off cash and it's yeah. coming our way. Yeah. True. Excellent. Okay. Any final thoughts from anyone? Um, Okay. Yeah. No, I just just to say that I think uh, it, it's a it's a it's a fine forum, and uh, happy and happy to be part of it at any point in time. Um, Excellent. Thank okay. you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll thank you very much. Our hand up to do this again, maybe in a month's time, because it's it's really good. It get, gets a nice message out, nice calm other industry guys. We, this is a great forum. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay. Well, yes, that, that does bring us to a close for this evening then. Hopefully it has been useful for everyone watching. Thank you very much for tuning in. And of course, many thanks to our guests, Robbie McRae from Caracol Gold, Ben Turney from Cavango Resources and George Roach from Premier African Minerals. It's been the first Stockbox Premier, the first live. It's been a success. I think we're bang on time but from everyone here at Stockbox. Good night. Thank you. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.